Okay, so we're going to be talking about Infinity Span on Google Cloud Platform. Uh, the ability to scale stuff in the cloud. So we're taking some uh, uh, application. Uh, we're going to go into details about what Infinity Span is. Uh, I may ask you some questions about your knowledge, uh, and then we're going to talk about how we can use the cloud to scale that uh, very simply, automatically. Uh, first thing, we're not Ray Zhang. No, we are not. How many of you came here specifically to see Ray? There's a couple of guys in the front. Okay, so <laughs> a few of you. Okay, Ray can't be here today, so we're going to take his place. Uh, I am Ludovic Champomar, and you are... Oh, no, sorry. Oh, yeah. No, no you're Mandy. The other way, right. Okay. No, you're Mandy. I'm yeah. Mandy Way, and this is Ludovic Champomar. Yeah, and uh, je peux parler aussi français. Sorry for you, but... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, je, je travaille dans, dans la plateforme uh, cloud de Google à San Francisco, un, uh, beaucoup sur uh, App Engine, un petit peu sur Compute Engine qu'on va, qu va voir aujourd'hui. And I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. Uh, I've been pretty much on my own in Europe for a while, so I cover most things. I do tend to focus on managed infrastructure, uh, things like automat automatic scaling of virtual machines, uh, things like Kubernetes and containers, that kind of stuff. Uh, so we're going to talk about... Oh, okay. That's an interesting lead into the discussion. We have... Uh, these aren't our slides, obviously. They are raised slides. Uh, so we may have a few surprises on the way, but I think we understand the content well enough to be able to deliver it. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the ability to scale and the ability to automatically provision uh, resources and decommission resources on demand and automatically based on events that happen. Uh, so we're going to be looking at automatic scaling. Uh, but first we have to introduce uh, some of the easy stuff. Oh, okay. Remember, I don't know the flow very well. Some of the easy stuff of all this is the ability to scale out. Scale out is generally quite easy. You can add machines. Uh, when we look at InfiniSpan, we can see that that is very easy to do. And we'll introduce InfiniSpan shortly. Uh, we can gather system metrics. We can analyze metrics and do stuff based on those metrics. Uh, we can develop stateless workloads which make life easy when it comes to automatically scaling things. If we want to add a virtual machine or a container, it helps if everything is stateless, because we don't have to worry about maintaining state on that container, particularly when we're scaling back in as well. So this is, this is the easy stuff. The more difficult stuff is doing things like custom metrics, things that you care about, application-specific metrics. Uh, stateful workloads are also tough, and the ability to scale in is very difficult. Um, we'll talk about that more shortly. So today we're going to talk about the difficult stuff, not the easy stuff. So the easy stuff should be fairly straightforward. So we're going to talk about InfiniSpan. How many of you are familiar with InfiniSpan and came here specifically to find out more about how you can do good stuff with InfiniSpan? Okay, so a few of you. Uh, how many of you are using key value pairs for caching, uh, a key value store for caching, generally in memory? How many of you are using Redis? <laughs> Okay, some of you are using Redis, okay. All right. I should probably ask at this stage, which key value store do you, do you prefer? Probably Memcache. How many of you are using Memcache? Still popular, although it tends to be trending downwards as Redis takes off uh, exponentially. Uh, but we have also things like Hazelcast, we have InfiniSpan. We have various options for storing key value uh, data in memory, uh, often with a backup as well, uh, which effectively serves as a cache for our application. Now, caches are great, but we want to be able to scale them. So this is what we're talking about today. So InfiniSpan is basically a distributed in-memory cache, uh, an in-memory key value store, uh, no SQL based. And it's also based on the JSR 107 implementation. I uh, probably shouldn't say implementation because JSR 107 has been around for a long time and it still isn't finished. Uh, but JSR 107 effectively provides uh, caching semantics for Java. Very, very simple. Uh, the idea would be you can take a concurrent hash map uh, and all the things that a concurrent hash map gives you locally in your virtual machine, you can replace with some caching, uh, some remote distributed cache uh, with exactly the same semantics when it comes to making calls. So anything that implements JSR 107 will support those features. InfiniSpan also provides distributed storage across a wide number of machines, and it has very good elastic properties. It's built on something called JGroups, uh, and it's very, very easy to add nodes and remove nodes from a cluster. It does all of this resizing dynamically, all on its own. And it also doesn't have to worry about things like having masters and split brains. Uh, JGroups is very, very good at handling coordination of adding nodes and removing nodes. 
So, for example, we have this situation here where we have three nodes. Now, let's talk about what a node is. A node in this case could be anything, a, a virtual machine running somewhere. It could be running in a box, uh, boxes next to your desk or in your server room. They could be running in the cloud. So these nodes could be virtual machines. They could ultimately be containers running on Docker. Or Rocket, maybe, <laughs> if you prefer the uh, core OS version of containers. So in this case, we have three keys. We have A, B, and C. And they are distributed across our three nodes in our cluster. So we have three nodes uh, and equally, dis equally distributed all of the keys. And that's what we care about, this equal distribution. As we scale up from three keys to 3,000 keys to 3 million keys to 3 billion keys, we want to maintain that distribution. OK? I need to get some water. I am a copious water drinker, so there will be some pauses. I hate pauses as well. I hate stopping to drink because I'm, I'm afraid you're all going to leave when I'm drinking. So don't leave. And I should say that Ludo is going to talk about computer engine shortly. So he's staying over there, but he's, he's helping and egging me on here. So three nodes, three keys could scale up to a large number of keys. But we also want to have some redundancy as well because if we have... Uh, one of these nodes go away, like node 1 would go away, we would lose key A. Uh, obviously, if this is a cache, that's not such a big deal. Uh, it will add latency to requests because we'd have to go and retrieve that from some data store or recalculate it and then store it back into the cache again. But if we have redundancy, we can avoid that. So we have, in this case, redundant versions of the keys across the cluster. And in Finisvan itself, we were having this conversation yesterday about how this would work in the cloud, and it would take some thinking about. But uh, Infinispan itself has the ability to say, I want you to make sure you avoid having my redundant copies on the same machine or in the same rack or even in the same data center. So if a data center gets hit by a nuclear bomb or something like that, your redundant copies are somewhere over there, safe. And let's hope data centers don't get hit by nuclear bombs, because that's not good. Oh, by the way, uh, we should say that our Twitter hashtags are down here. So that's you, right? Yeah. So we are we like Twitter. So if you have any questions that you don't feel confident about asking today, uh, please tweet us, and we will do our best to answer your questions. Uh, and please tweet anyway. If you like the talk, if you don't like the talk, just let us know, and uh, we will consider your feedback for future talks. But remember, this is Ray talking. So if you don't like it, it's Ray's fault. So, what about adding more capacity to our cluster? So we started off with three nodes. And we have three nodes, redundant copies of our keys, and we have another node added to our cluster. We just added this node. More capacity. So now we can store more entries. And we are kind of very conscious about the amount of uh, memory we're using, uh, particularly Java heap space. Uh, so that's a big consideration for us. So we want to distribute everything evenly, but we also want to make sure that we have enough capacity to be able to store all of the entries we need. Obviously, we have things like eviction policies and uh, other kind of policies we can use to remove data uh, dynamically as needed. Uh, but adding more capacity will make our application hopefully more responsive because we can cache more data. So in this case, when we've added the node, we've gone from this situation to this situation where we are now rebalanced uh, by moving one of the keys to node 4, to our new node. We still have a redundant copy of it over here, but now we've rebalanced. It's not particularly well balanced because we don't have enough keys to do a very good balancing job. Yeah, but this is all done dynamically uh, through J groups and through coordination and through a consistent hash wheel. So if you know consistent hashing, you'll understand how this is all performed. But this is all performed dynamically by the cluster. You don't have to do anything. Add the node, it will rebalance, and we can show you this in the demo shortly. So InfiniSpan supports various APIs. We're going to talk about one specifically. It supports RESTful API. It supports all of the memcache semantics. So if you're used to using memcache and you want to replace it, plug it in InfiniSpan, then that's fine. Uh, it also supports WebSockets. And as I said to uh, one of my colleagues yesterday, if I put this on the slide, I should talk about it. But I didn't actually do any research into how it implements WebSockets, so I can't talk on that point. But if you're interested in WebSockets on InfiniSpan, let me know. But one thing we can do is look at some examples of the REST uh, API. And here we have a client up here uh, wearing a football shirt by the looks of it. And this client wants A. He wants key A, or the value of a key A. 
And so he makes a call via REST API, which goes to internally within his client some load balancer, road, a round robin load balancer, which understands reasonably the topology of the uh, cluster. It will make a call to one of the nodes, round robin style. It will say to node two in this case, because that's the next one in the, the round robin list, it will say, I want key A. And node two will say, I don't have key A, but I can get it for you. So I will go and get key A uh, from node one, where it is, and I will copy it to my local cache. So this has its own cache. Uh, it's gone to node one to get value A, uh, keep the value for key A, and it's cached it's itself. And now it's responded back to the client and given it key A. If we hit node two again for the same key, we have it in local cache. We have it in this L1 cache. Uh, this is a little bit different from the main cache. It has different uh, properties in terms of how long things will be kept there. Uh, ultimately, that will go away and will be cleared out. But for convenience now, understanding this may be a key that we need uh, repeatedly, we can actually go back and get the key from node 2 because it has it in local cache. And that's obviously add some overhead. We've gone to a node, the node has said, I don't have that key, I have to go and get that key for you. I will pull it over, store it locally, give you the response back. Future uh, requests for that won't ha have that overhead, providing they hit one of the nodes that either has the key or has a cache copy of the key. Okay? So that adds some overhead, uh, not the best situation. So what it, the guys at InfiniSpan did, and I think they're mostly Red Hat people, uh, they implemented this thing called Hot Rod, which includes smart routing. And what happens here is the client actually understands completely the topology of the network. It knows where to look for everything. It understands the consistent hash. And so understanding the consistent hash that we use, it means it can understand exactly where it needs to go to find a given key. So Hot Rod will effectively allow us to say, I, I know exactly where to go to get that key. In this case, we make a request from the client, go straight to node one where a is stored and it will retrieve A. And so now we've removed that overhead we had with the previous example. <coughs> and again, node C, it will go to node C, uh, node N to get, uh, node N? Node N to get uh, key C. Okay, so that's the way it works. And so that simplifies things for us. Uh, client side is a little bit more complicated, but most of it's a library, you can implement very easily. Uh, so InfiniSpan also think, supports things like in-memory MapReduce. Uh, and there's a link there. The slides are being shared with the organizers, so you can click on the links and follow them. Uh, it also supports uh, persistent storage. So uh, as with Redis and not with Memcache, we have the ability to store persistently any data. We can have two different methods of doing that. One is the write through, where we actually uh, write through the cache straight into the store, leaving the version in the cache uh, as we're writing. That takes a little bit longer because we have to write through the storage, through to storage, and it can't complete until it's actually stored within the storage system. Now that could be a file, it could be uh, uh, some uh, database, it could be a NoSQL data store, uh, but ultimately we have to wait for the data to be stored before we can come back to the client to say it's complete. Right behind allows us to say, okay, I'm just going to write to the cache, and the cache can sync with store at some given point in time in the future. Uh, the Obviously, the persistent capabilities there are a little bit different. Uh, the guarantees on persistence may not be complete because while the data is in memory, but not obviously in the back in store, that node could go away and we could lose that version uh, of data that we've changed. So if you want to reliably store your data, you use right through. If you don't care so much, you use right behind. Uh, in terms of back in stores, we support file system, JDBC, MongoDB, uh, Ray also rate connectors for Google's level DB and also for JPA, the Java persistence architecture. So we have various options for back install, but we're not really interested in that today, so we'll skip over that. And Ray also wrote a visualizer. Uh, unfortunately, the GitHub uh, repository isn't private, it's still private currently. Uh, we'll make sure that gets fixed. So when you get these slides, you'll be able to click on that and go and see the visualizer. And we'll show you the visualizer running shortly. So now we're going to talk about Infinity's and at scale, and Ludo is going to introduce Compute Engine. Uh, oui, merci, Mandy. Uh, donc, uh, je vais un petit peu parler de Compute Engine. Pourquoi Parce qu'en fait, un des, une des personnes de, de Red Hat, uh, uh, il y a pratiquement un an, uh, m'avait contacté parce que je, je, je parle beaucoup avec les gens de, de, de Red Hat, 
Et il m'avait demandé, est-ce que je pourrais avoir quelques machines pour, pour faire un benchmark, en fait, de, de Infinispan Et donc, j'ai pu parler à quelques product, euh, product managers. Et euh, on a réussi à avoir un budget pour, euh, pour à peu près 500 nodes. Donc, en fait, euh, on, on, leur a, on leur a donné euh, la possibilité de faire un benchmark de, de 500 nodes qu'ils ont fait au mois de, de, de juillet. Donc, euh, je n'ai pas vu d'autres benchmarks du style euh, Redis ou même Cache euh, sur Compute Engine. Donc, c'est au moins c'est intéressant de voir qu'au moins pour euh, un, un des, une des solutions ici qui est Infinite Span, euh, il, il a réussi à faire euh, le benchmark très facilement avec 500 nodes. Et en fait, on, on lui a ordonné 1000 nodes, il les aurait utilisés, il aurait pu, il aurait pu prouver que euh, son software marchait sur, euh, sur euh, 1000 nodes. Donc voilà, c'est Donc, euh, un petit peu ça qu'on va euh, euh, regarder euh, maintenant au niveau de, de la plateforme euh, Compute Engine. Donc elle est assez neuve comme, comme plateforme. Euh, c'est l'infrastructure le, 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 as a service euh, fournie par, par Google. Donc euh, ça permet de, pour vous de créer des, des VM un peu partout dans le monde, enfin, aux états unis en Europe et, et en Asie. Euh, le networking entre ces, ces, euh, ces VM et, et enfin, une, une, une solution Google complètement basée sur le software, sur SDN-based euh, euh, networking, le coût est assez intéressant. C'est-à-dire que quand vous, quand vous consommez euh, 10, 10 minutes d'une VM, vous, euh, après 10 minutes, vous ne payez qu'à la minute près. Donc euh, si vous utilisez euh, 15 minutes de, de VM, vous ne paierez que 15 minutes et non pas une heure comme, euh, comme d'autres. Euh, pour le storage, le cloud data store, en fait, euh, vous ne payez que, que la, la, la quantité d'attaque que vous, que, vous, euh, que vous mettez dans, dans, dans le storage. Et euh, il y a out of the box, un, un, une couche de load balancing qui, euh, que, 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 que Google vous offre indépendamment de, de vos VM. Donc vous n'êtes vous pas chargé pour une VM qui, qui est en charge de, du load balancer. C'est nativement euh, compris dans la plateforme. Euh, on essaye de, de, de faire euh, booter les VM le plus, le plus vite possible. Donc, euh, tout, tout les, 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 tout, tous les mois à peu près, y a, on, on gagne un petit peu en, 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 en secondes le, le boot time des VM. C'est très important dans, quand, quand, quand on scale up and down. Euh, donc, on essaye d'avoir une, une, une performance qui est, qui est consistante. Donc voilà, euh, les, les OS ou les instances que vous pouvez choisir, c'est euh, Debian, CentOS, ici. Euh, il y a même Windows Server, donc on a un partnership avec, euh, avec Microsoft pour avoir des, des, des VM Windows. Et vous avez le choix entre un, un core, ou même un tout petit peu moins qu'un core, parce qu'il y, y a la, la micro qui, qui, qui est vraiment pas très chère. Et euh, il y a un mois, on a sorti euh, 30, 32 cores, donc... Euh, avant, on était, on était, enfin, vous étiez limité à 16 corps et depuis un mois maintenant, vous pouvez monter à 32 corps. L'intérêt d'avoir plus de corps, donc c'est forcément plus de, 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 de power, mais aussi euh, on vous donne plus de, de, de network capacity. C'est-à-dire que euh, euh, la, 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 la bandwidth qu'on vous offre par, par corps grandit en fonction du nombre de corps que vous prenez. Euh, la mémoire jusqu'à 200, 200 gigas, donc en fait euh, vous avez le choix entre euh, euh, plus de mémoire ou euh, plus de corps et, euh, pour, 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 bien, pour bien choisir le, le type de machine que vous voulez en fonction de, de, de la workload que vous avez. Euh, on supporte aussi des live migrations, donc on a vu qu'il y avait plusieurs data centers, euh, chaque data center a, enfin, des, des zones, Asie, euh, états unis Europe, et chaque, euh, chaque zone a des sous data centers, donc euh, de temps en temps, on, on, on a des, 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 des événements de, de maintenance de data center et vous pouvez migrer votre, votre, votre workload de manière plus ou moins transparente en, en, en la transposant d'une région à une autre. Euh, ça, c'est baked in dans, dans, dans le système, c'est très intéressant pour, euh, pour euh, la... la, 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 la pour que votre application soit toujours maintenue. Euh, au niveau disque, encore une fois, vous ne payez que le, le, le storage, vous ne, vous ne payez pas pour, pour les, les, les I.O. Euh, tout ce qui est stocké sur disque est complètement encrypté. Donc, euh, il n'y a que vous qui, pou qui pouvez accéder à ces données. Euh, et là aussi, on peut migrer des disques de, de zone à zone. Donc, euh, il y a différents types de disques. Euh, 
persistent disk euh, classique, donc hard drive, le, 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 vrai, le vrai vieux hard drive. Et puis, on, on, on pousse de plus en plus sur les, les SSD euh, drive, euh, où là, vous pouvez aussi faire des snapshots et euh, choisir entre, euh, entre 1 giga de storage jusqu'à 10 terabytes euh, de disque, qui est assez, euh, est assez euh, intéressant. Euh, il y a une notion un peu plus poussée de, de euh, SSD qui est le local, euh, le, le local SSD, donc qui est vraiment très très proche de la machine qui, qui va hosté la VM pour avoir des, des, euh, des latencies euh, en, en dessous de la, la milliseconde. Donc ça aussi, ça aussi au niveau performance, c'est euh, quand même pas de la mémoire, mais c'est pas loin de la mémoire. Quoi. Donc voilà, euh, vous pouvez scaler euh, en fonction de comment, euh, quel type de disque vous prenez. Euh, euh, vous, pouvez, vous pouvez choisir. Bon là, la, la scale est, est, est log. Euh, donc entre 1 et 200 euh, au niveau performance d'accès à vos données. Euh, Là, vous voyez les nodes. Donc, il y a un node qui, est, qui peut écrire, écri euh, lire et écrire dans, dans le persistent disk et beaucoup, euh, beaucoup d'autres nodes qui peuvent, euh, qui peuvent, euh, qui peuvent euh, lire en, en mode read-only euh, ce, ce disque. Euh, networking, euh, là aussi, c'est euh, complètement software-based euh, networking. Euh, vous pouvez choisir entre différents types d'IP adresses ou éphémères, c'est-à-dire qu'on vous, euh, euh, vous la donne de manière random et tant, tant que votre VM est, est, est up and running, euh, vous la gardez, mais après, si la VM reboot, euh, l'IP le, le, changera. Euh, il y a un, des règles euh, que vous pouvez manipuler soit avec la console, soit en mode command line ou soit en mode API euh, pour, pour gérer les, les règles de firewall, pour savoir qui, qui a le droit de faire quoi ou quel port vous œuvrez sur, sur votre network. Donc tout ça, en fait, c'est de l'informatique classique, mais en fait à l'échelle de Google. C'est-à-dire que euh, mettre, en place, euh, mettre en place un benchmark de Infinite Span avec euh, 500 nodes, euh, c'était euh, vraiment facile. Donc maintenant, Mandy va, va vous montrer comment euh, ce benchmark, enfin comment ce, ce, ce produit Infinite Span a, a, est mis en, mis en place sur un, un système comme euh, la, la plateforme cloud de, de Google. Donc, Mandy, it's up to you now. <laughs> uh -huh. Right, okay. We're not talking about Firebase, but if anyone wants a Firebase sticker, I've got some up here. Uh, any of you know what Firebase is, but we should be talking about Firebase, it's great. But we're not talking about it now, we're talking about InfiniSpan. So, let's talk about running InfiniSpan on Google Compute Engine. Oh, by the way, does anybody here not speak French? Okay, that's good. <laughs> Just in case, like, Ludo's uh, bit was missed on everybody. <laughs> Because it was announced as an English talk, and that just kind of occurred to me. Right, okay, so it's pretty straightforward to get started running InfiniSpan on a virtual machine on Google Cloud Platform. Uh, well, on any platform, on Amazon, on Azure, uh, regardless, it's very easy to get up and running with InfiniSpan. You start a virtual machine, you do an install, you w get the packages and do the appropriate installation, uh, maybe sudo app get to install other things that are required. You do some configuration and basically you run. There's a shell script that will get started, uh, cluster.sh-b and the interface name, and then you repeat that on each node. So if you have multiple nodes, they can all join together, Providing we provide the correct configuration uh, for the Java ops, we can actually have all these machines form a cluster together. Uh, it uses IP multicast uh, at the lower level uh, for the J groups transport, and that effectively allows all these machines to cooperate together and actually form this cluster dynamically. So, talking about IP multicast, this is what we have. So, node one effectively joins the cluster, uh, it announces via multicast. Hey guys, I'm here, I'm this machine, this is my IP address. Uh, okay, so um, public clouds, that doesn't work because we don't support IP multicast. So J Groups is basically built on top of IP multicast, so we need some other way of doing this. Fortunately for us, uh, J Groups also supports different transports. Uh, it supports things like JDBC ping, file ping, Google ping. And effectively what this involves is writing files somewhere. Somewhere where each node in the cluster can get to uh, and write its own file and read the rest of the topology. So in this case, uh, well for S3 ping, you would write 
your configuration to an S3 bucket. Uh, and each node in the cluster would write its own configuration to the bucket. Uh, and it would read the rest of the uh, configuration information for the other nodes. Uh, so that's effectively how we build a cluster. For Google Ping, we actually use Google Cloud Storage, uh, which is very similar to S3. So basically, the node comes along. It says, I'm going to join the cluster. It writes its file, its configuration file, to Google Cloud Storage. Then it reads all of the other configuration files to the other nodes, effectively allowing it to understand the topology of the network. And this is done very simply uh, through some options. Uh, we can specify the bucket name and also the credentials needed to access the bucket. So this is everything that uh, Infinity Span needs in order to be able to authenticate itself against the bucket and store data there. So it's very secure and it's very easy to configure. And again, the same thing for S3 as well, just a different provider. So let's talk about auto scaling in Uh Today, it's kind of difficult. Uh, we want to have a target number of entries per node. Going back to our original configuration where we had one entry per node, we may scale up to thousands. Uh, we want to be able to automatically scale based on the number of entries per node. Okay? So if we get to a certain limit, we'll add another node. And as we've seen, we can dynamically rebalance the entire cache across the extra node. That would give us more space. So by adding more instances, we actually automatically get more additional space without actually having to do very much at all. So in terms of a high level uh, view of this, uh, an abstract view, it looks like this. We have nodes running in infinity span and also doing metrics collection via JMX. Uh, this is all automatic and built in. Nothing much to do here. Uh, we also have a metric server. It's collecting metrics from JMX. We have an autoscaler with some kind of configuration for autoscaling. Uh, when we should autoscale, what, based on what we should autoscale on. The maximum number of instances we should have, the minimum number of instances we have. Uh, maybe a cool down period to stop us from going backwards and forwards, spinning up instances and dropping them down again. An actuator which will actually perform the process of creating new instances or tearing down old instances. And we also have a template that will say, this is how you build a new instance. Because we need to be able to build new instances exactly the same as the other instances that are in, in the, uh, what we're going to call a group in a second. Uh, metric store as well, we're not going to worry about that. So basically, the, when we're scaling out, we have to say how many instances we need. In this case, we have a pool maybe of two instances. We're saying the actuator will add new instances on demand as required. And the scaling scenario is very similar. In this case, we're going to remove instances. So we may take one away, we may take two away, depending on the requirements uh, of our auto-scaling configuration. So the auto-scaling configuration looks something like this uh, for our specific scenario. It could be different. Um, we'll go through that in a second. Uh, so number of entries per node. This is going to be 1,000 for us. Uh, target utilization will be 100%. Uh, the image source, the template we're going to use for creating new instances will be uh, the InfiniSpan node template that we've created. Uh, we'll go through that in a second. Maximum number of instances and a minimum number of instances. So this is the pool size. This is how much we can grow elastically. Uh, so we're going to talk about some specific things from Compute Engine that Luda didn't cover, which they're kind of specific to what we're doing here. So we have this notion of a managed instance group. Uh, this is a group of managed virtual machines uh, running on Google Compute Engine. And because these are managed, they're all identical. They're all completely homogenous, absolutely identical. Look at one, and you won't be able to tell any difference from another one. And when we remove one or add one, we're doing effectively the same. We're creating instances that are absolutely identical. Uh, these are managed and created by something called an instance group manager. And instances created from a template, which is associated with this managed instance group, uh, sorry, with the managed instance group itself. And the template we're going to look at in the next slide, maybe the slide after. And also, we define a number of instances within a group uh, when we create the group. We're going to auto scale it later. That may change the size of the group. Uh, but for now, we're going to say how many instances we want in that group initially. And this is the relationship between instance group manager and instance template and managed instance groups. So the managed instance groups is a group of virtual machines. The instance group manager takes care of provisioning and tearing them down. This is the actuator in our earlier slide. And we have an instance template, which is used to create new virtual machines, new identical virtual machines. And instance group manager, uh, I'm not going to get into this too much, but it basically manages the, the process of uh, 
add in machines and taking machines away from the managed instance group. Uh, it can be accessed via an API or via a CLI. And you can do things like deleting instances from the group. You can take an instance out and say, this instance is special. I, I don't want it in the group anymore, but I want to keep it. I can abandon it from the pool, from the group. Or you can recreate your instances. And because these instances are all identical, they can all be replaced by other instances that are identical. Uh, we don't care whether they, a particular machine exists. We just care we have a number of them. Instance templates, again, this effectively separates the configuration of an instance from its provisioning. So we're basically creating something that we can a cookie cut or we can effectively use to stamp out new instances. Uh, it provides defaults for all settings, so it's very easy to get started with. Uh, and it's a global resource. It can be used across all of our regions and all of, all of our zones. So regardless of where you're running in uh, Google Compute Engine, you can use an instance template. And it's created like this. We're basically providing a configuration on the command line. We have this uh, gcloud command, which is our cloud SDK, uh, our CLI tool for all things for Google Cloud Platform. Uh, in this case, we're just saying compute instance templates, create, and we're providing information. The things we care about here are the startup script and the shutdown script, which we'll look at shortly. We want to configure these machines uh, to be specific, to be running in Finispan. Uh, they're all identical, but they're all running in Infinispan. Our startup and shutdown scripts look like this. Uh, so the startup script will ultimately download binaries, do installation, uh, provide configuration, will start in Finispan and start a metrics collector. Our shutdown script would ultimately run something to remove it from the cluster. It doesn't have to do much, it can just disappear and the cluster can work it out itself, but we can actually shut this machine down gracefully, remove it from the cluster in a proper way. But it can just go away if it needs to, and the cluster will work it out. It's like, ah, one of our machines is gone. We need to rebalance, and it will rebalance. Uh, a managed instance group is used, uh, created like this. We're just creating a group called ISPN group. Again, we're using the gcloud command, and we're providing a template name. And we're also saying we want two of these initially. Uh, we can provide a base instance name as well. So all of, our, all of our machines will have names, but we can provide some base instance name. The rest of it will be uh, a randomly assigned uh, hash. Autoscaling, uh, we care about autoscaling. We're talking about autoscaling here. So how this works is we have our instance group manager and our managed instance group. That can create and destroy virtual machines. The autoscaler itself will talk to the instance group manager and say, Based on metrics I've received, I want you to autoscale. I want you to remove instances or add instances. And the metrics the autoscaler can monitor are things like CPU utilization on average across the group. It can also look at load balancer utilization and autoscale based on those metrics. But it also can hook into our thing called cloud monitoring. And cloud monitoring effectively allows us to look at disk I.O., memory, uh, all of the utilization for a Linux virtual machine. And it can also look at custom metrics, uh, application-specific metrics, metrics that you provide. So we can scale based on monitoring events, uh, and we're going to look at that shortly. Autoscaler is easy to create. We just basically say uh, what metric we're going to be looking at. In this case, we talked about number of entries early, earlier, how many entries we have on a node. So that's what we care about. This is a gauge. It's something that we can measure. And we're going to start with two replicas. We're going to have a maximum of 10. Our target utilization is 100. And the group we're actually targeting, the managed instance group, is called ISPN group. And that's it. So once that's created, the autoscaler will be attached to the managed instance group. And it can now start watching the uh, utilization of the group via our custom metric. And will scale up and scale down as required. So custom metrics. We care about number of entries down here. So we're looking at the instance groups. Uh, we're looking at the number of entries per node. We care about that. We're gathering that into cloud monitoring. And cloud monitoring is passing information back onto the autoscaler to say, hey, we need to do something. Uh, we need to scale up or we need to scale down. This is quite a lot of text. Uh, I'm going to kind of gloss over this a bit. Uh, so monitoring metrics, we have the option to do standard metrics, which are these are ones we support out of the box with Google Cloud Monitoring. Or you can provide custom cloud metrics custom cloud monitoring metrics. You can provide your own metrics, so something you're interested in. In this case, number of entries on the node. Uh, we have other things as well, things like the types of metrics, uh, valid values, and this is the command line for actually creating a new autoscaler using a 
uh, custom metric, using a metric, not a custom metric. Custom metric is a little bit different. Uh, it's something you provide yourself. It has to obey certain rules. It has to be a per virtual machine metric. So it, it has to make sense in terms of virtual machines. And it has to be something that's proportional to the number of virtual machines. So as it gets bigger, you need to grow the size of the machines. As it grows smaller, you have to shrink the size of the machines. Uh, and there's other things as well that it has to adhere to. But ultimately, it can be anything, any application level metric that you like. And how we make this work with InfiniSpan is via JMX. Um, somebody wrote this clever piece of code that actually converts JMX to the output we require. Uh, this could be any output. So basically, we're taking a JMX event and we're writing it out to somewhere else. Our output writer in this case is Google Cloud Monitoring. It's a Google, Cl uh, Google Cloud Monitoring writer, and the metric name is number of entries. So we're effectively converting this JMX signal, which is automatically generated by InfiniSpan, and we're converting it into a metric that can be used by Cloud Monitoring. Okay. So going back to this, uh, this is what we had before. We have nodes, we have metric servers, we have the metric store, autoscaler, actuator, and the templates. All this working together. This is kind of abstract. And if we substitute in the names of all of the Google Compute Engine things we're using, this starts to look uh, more sensible. We have Compute Engine nodes, uh, Compute Engine virtual machines. We have Cloud Monitoring for metrics gathering. We have Autoscaler for doing our autoscaling. We have the Instance Group Manager as our actuator. This will add new instances and remove instances. And we have an instance template which will define what a new instance looks like. Ultimately, it's responsible for configuring InfiniSpan on the node. And that's it. So how are we doing for time? Ooh. 15 minutes. OK. 14 minutes. Right, OK. So demos. How many people like watching demos? Yeah. How many people like watching demos that fail? <laughs> is the wi is the Wi-Fi working currently? That's my question. Because this is obviously a cloud-based demo. Uh, we have a video. So we can fall back on the video if we need to. But we're going to do a demo. Uh, so first thing we really want to do is be able to build this fairly quickly. Uh, we talked about startup scripts. So when it comes to building images, virtual machine images, there's two ways of doing it, uh, provisioning virtual machines. You can either bake or you can bootstrap. When you bootstrap, you're basically saying, I have a basic virtual machine with a basic OS image. Uh, could be Debian, could be CentOS. And I'm going to have a startup script that emits a bunch of commands that will configure the virtual machine as it's provisioned. So this will run things like sudo apt get update, sudo apt get uh, install vim or whatever, <coughs> some package. It will start services, it will edit files, it will do all of the things you need to configure that virtual machine. But it will do it at provision time, so it takes a bit longer, so it has to install all this stuff. Uh, so basically it will download binaries, do all the installation, do all the configuration. And what we're going to do is actually do a bake an image. Uh, we're going to bake an image, which effectively means saying we will create a configuration, which we care about. This is what we want to base our uh, configuration on. And then we will create an image, a new image, from that configuration. So basically, we configure the machine as we need it to be, and then we create a new image, which we can then use for installing and provisioning all of our new virtual machines. So we don't have to go through these steps uh, one by one at provision time. And to do that, what we do is we create the virtual machine uh, that we want to take an image of, and then we can do gcloud compute, images create, the uh, name of the image, and then the source disk. This is some disk that we have in Compute Engine. And it will create a new image for us called ISPN image. And then when we go to create new virtual machines, we can just use this image. Now, what you normally do is have a base image, and then have some startup scripts uh, bootstrapping as well, just to maybe kind of tweak the configuration. Maybe some dynamic uh, this uh, in terms of naming nodes or having ports exposed and such like that you may have to tweak in your startup scripts. So here, what we do is we replace download binaries, installation, and configuration with an image. Then we start in Finispan and start the JMX trans uh, independently from the, uh, within the script. So this isn't part of the image. So that simplifies the process of building an image, and it speeds up the process of building an image. We're auto-scaling. We want these images to come up quickly. Uh, traditionally, on Google Compute Engine, instances come up within 30 seconds, which is pretty fast compared to some of the other providers. Uh, but you want to kind of minimize that. 
you don't want to install huge amounts of software by your provision of virtual machines. It will take longer to provision. You also have to be aware of resource quotas. So when you sign up for a cloud project at cloud.google.com, uh, you will get a project. You will have certain amount of quota you can uh, use initially. You can request increases for that. So you'll get 24 CPUs. You'll have 23 public IP addresses, one terabyte of SSD persistent disk, four local SSD devices. And there's a full list on that link there. Uh, you can request quota increases very easily. There's a form. You click on a, click on a link. It takes you to a form. And you can say, I need more quota in this region. Uh, you can also avoid one of the big pitfalls is IP addresses. If your machine is completely internal, you don't need to have external IP addresses. So you can just use internal IP addresses, which are completely free, uh, and avoid having to use either ephemeral or static external IP addresses. And then the only way you can talk to those virtual machines is from another virtual machine, uh, <coughs> but, or via VPN. So you can also use NAT as well for outbound traffic. So that will simplify the amount of uh, resources you need to use. How many instances do we need? So if we're going to be scaling up, how many instances do we need? Say we start with one, we have an average load of 280, our target load is 100. Uh, that means we're going to need three machines. We're already going to over our, our average load, which is 100. So we need to bump up that to three, and that will cover the 280 that we have currently. Uh, whenever we do an auto scale event, we have this cool down period of user defined. Uh, specification. It could be 30 seconds, it could be a minute. But basically you're saying to the autoscaler, I don't want you to keep going backwards and forwards, adding machines, removing machines. I want you to wait a little while for things to settle down. Uh, so that's what the cool down period is. It's completely configurable. And when we terminate instances, again we've gone from a situation where we have three nodes, but the average load has now dropped to 30. Uh, the target average load is still 100. We only really need one node now, so we need to terminate two instances. Scaling in takes a little bit longer. So we charge by the minute for Google Computing Engine instances. So we charge for the first 10 minutes and then per minute afterwards. So there's no point in us bringing up a machine for a minute and then tearing it down. We'll keep it up for 10 minutes in case we need to use it again. After those 10 minutes are gone, it's now a candidate to be removed. And the way we work out which machine should be removed is quite complicated, uh, but the whole idea is that these machines should be completely independent. They should be able to, any machine should be able to run your work. So when we tear one down, the work can be run on some other, some other node in the cluster. Uh, so one of the potential problems that we have is we have this thing called num owners, which determines the number of replicas that we have uh, of a piece of data, of a key uh, across our cluster. If num owners equals two, and two machines go down in our cluster, then potentially we've lost all versions of that data. So that's one of the potential problems. So I'm now going to run into a demo which actually talks about how this all works. So we have this visualizer. Actually, I'm going to play the video. This is safer, I think. I don't trust the Wi-Fi. And I'll talk through the video. Yeah, my connection's closed. All right, so let's pause this a bit. I think I'm running fast here, so playback speed slow. Go back to the beginning. So as usual with recording these videos, I recorded it in a small font because when you're doing the demo, generally you think, ah, oh, I need to make the font bigger, but I forgot in this, so it's a little bit smaller than it should be. But this is basically the Google Developers Console. Uh, we have lots of options. All of the options for Google uh, Cloud are on the left-hand side, including Compute Engine. Uh, so Compute, Compute Engine, and then we can see VM instances and instance groups, which we've been talking about. And it provides dashboards, uh, utilization, and such like. Down here we have two instances. This is the size of our pool initially. We have two instances. Uh, and then we'll kick things off with the demo. So we have a script that will actually generate load for us. And this will basically push entries into uh, our InfiniSpan cluster. Uh, and go back to normal speed, I think. So we've kicked off the demo. And again, you can't see that. It doesn't matter. It's just a, a, a Java command line string. And this is doing the demo. It's actually generate, generating load, pushing it out into the cluster. 
And we can see, and I'll pause this, we have two nodes currently. These are the two nodes we had initially, and they're filling up with data very quickly. And what we have here, this is the way Ray's designed it, is that we have the inner ring is 1, the outer ring is 10, so up to 99, and the very outer ring is 100. So it's orders of magnitude, effectively. Okay. Can you still hear me? Okay, so basically at this point we have probably 199, or maybe going up, well, 111 at that point. So we're getting into the point we have 100 there. So that basically shows us two nodes and the utilization increasing. And I've kind of cut the video a little bit shorter uh, to make it easier. So you'll see some jumps as we jump up uh, in scale. But now we're adding uh, more entries. We now have up to 290, 326, 327. These are balanced. We have uh, replicas as well. So we're having copies of these made across both of the machines, both of the virtual machines. We're up to 400 now. 500, 585. So the number I'm talking about is this one here. And that's basically showing you how many entries on each node. My editing was done just before this talk, so it's not going to be perfect. <laughs> I'm definitely not Steven Spielberg when it comes to editing. Right, so now we're going to get to a point where we're going to get to above 1,000. Above 1,000, we're going to be selling the autoscaler now. To, we've hit our limit. 1,000 entries is our maximum limit for these nodes. We want more nodes now. Now... Autoscaler will take time to spin new instances up, which is why you have to make sure you have capacity and plan ahead effectively. Uh, if I go back to that a little bit, we can see the number of instances we have change from two to three very quickly. Uh, I don't think I can pause it. Uh, go back. So it's changed from two to three. We've added an instance. But it's going to take time to come up and then add itself to the cluster. So we carry on. Now we've moved forward in time a bit. We're up to 2,700. Uh, and at some point, the new node will be added. I think I refreshed at that point because I was getting frustrated waiting for it to be added. But you'll suddenly see the number changed. Uh, so where it's 3,000 at the moment, that will suddenly change as we rebalance the entire cluster as we add a new node. Come on. <laughs> I should have recorded this last night and done a better job of editing. We still have three nodes running. Yes, Mandy, we know that. And now we've rebalanced. We now have three nodes. We're still over the limit. We still need to add more nodes. So the autoscaler is busy behind the scenes adding more nodes as required. So when we've said 1,000 entries maximum, We've been very conservative. Uh, we really know that we want to start auto-scaling at that point, but we have capacity to, to do more. So now we have three. We're still waiting for the auto-scaler to kick in and add more instances. Gone forward in time a bit. We're completely balanced. We're still adding more entries. But we need to have more machines to get back to our 1,000 uh, entries per machine. Du, 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 du. Come on. Let's go a bit faster. So now, oh, that's a problem you can't control when things stop. So now we have a bunch more machines been added. Uh, so now we've scaled up our pool. Those machines will soon appear in our cluster. And everything will rebalance, and we should get to a point where we only have less than 1,000. So now we have five nodes, and we have less than 1,000 entries. The load generations have stopped. Well, I stopped the load generation at 5,000. So now we have a balanced, uh, a balanced cluster, five nodes, all with less than 1,000. And if those entries dropped, if they're evicted or removed uh, because they have some kind of uh, timeout on them, uh, then the pool will scale down and remove instances. So you have what you need when you need it. This is quite an extreme example because we're, we're scaling up quite rapidly. Uh, so the expectation is that you have to kind of consider how fast you're going to need to scale and anticipate a little bit of a, ahead of time. But that's it. Uh, oh, we had, it went over the top and added two more instances. It will remove them shortly. So basically, that's pretty much it. Uh, go back to the slides and wrap up. Find my slides. So 
So in summary, so InfiniSpan, very easy to scale uh, in, in memory key value store, much easier to scale than, say, memcache, where you have to actually do configuration. You have to tell the client the list of servers that you're using for your memcache. Uh, and computes, recomputing, hashing, and such like is quite difficult with memcache. Uh, it gets easier as you start using things like Redis. Uh, Google Compute Engine is perfect for auto scaling virtual machine groups. So, if you want to scale something like InfiniSpan, then using something like Google Compute Engine is really easy. And if you're interested in using Google Cloud Platform, there's a free trial. Uh, you just go to cloud.google.com. It's not on there, which I wish it was. Cloud.google.com, and you you'll see everywhere free trial buttons, a big blue button saying free trial. Click on that and you can sign up. You'll get $300 worth of credits uh, and that means you can run a, uh, a standard two-core two virtual machine 24-7 for 60 days. Store over 11 terabytes of data or process 60 terabytes of data with BigQuery. And there's a feedback form. Again, we're not Ray Zhang. We are Ludovic Champenois and Mandy Waits. Uh, if you have any feedback, please go to this QR code or to that URL and provide your feedback. I think time's up, but any last questions? Do we have a break? Is lunch now or? Yep. Any questions then? Food. Hey, question. You mean when scaling down? Right, okay, so Auto scale is still in beta, uh, so it's being developed based on user feedback. So one of the biggest bits of feedback we've had is how do we control which, which instances get removed from the group? So it's not been completely finalized yet, but we're looking at different ways in which we can do this. We already have policies in place to make sure we, we prioritize certain virtual machines for removal. Machines that haven't finished being spun up yet, we'll remove them. Uh, machines that have only been up for a short time, we'll remove them. But we're also going to provide some mechanism by which you can say as a user, uh, I, this machine cannot be removed until it's finished. Uh, another way you can do it is actually remove the machine from the group, and once you finish your work, you shut the machine down yourself. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. So you can actually abandon the machine from the group and say, this machine will run to completion, it will finish, we can, res we, we can resize the group again. So that's one way of doing it. But we will provide mechanisms by which users can actually control which machines get removed. Uh, just not ha we just don't have it yet. Thank you for the question. Uh, any other questions? Okay, no questions, right. So you can catch us. Uh, we're going to be probably hanging out at the uh, data center cafe. If you want coffee, we have Google coffee, which is very nice. Thank you.